Hey everyone, welcome back to the next episode of Offspring Magazine, the podcast. I'm your host, Srinath Ramkumar. And joining me today again is Nikolai Herman. Hi everyone. And Alison Lewis. Hey there. So uh, today we got an episode where we're going to interview one of the new vice presidents of the Max Planck Society, who is uh, Dr. Asifa Akhtar. What do you guys have planned in mind to ask her? Yeah, I mean, the thing is, she's an international um, uh, vice president. So her maybe goals for the her term might be to help the international people. At least that's what she also said in another interview. So I mm-hmm. think this is one point we can focus on. Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, also, she's an international citizen. She's been around the world in so many places, right? That is true. So I yeah. think it's important that she also brings this aspect of uh, uh, international experience into the Max Planck Society as a vice president with uh, so many different uh, characteristics. And I think she'll bring the perspective both of being international in Germany as well as like being a woman in science, which is also. is still in many fields a minority. So I, I hope that'll be a valuable perspective to the Max Planck Society. Definitely. So I think we need to really capitalize on this opportunity that we have to ask her the questions that we need to ask her so we can understand better and uh, thank her for her time, I suppose. And without any further ado, let's get on with this interview of uh, Dr. Asifa Akhtar, the new vice president of the biomedical section of the Max Planck Society. Dr. Asif Akhtar, thanks a lot for joining us today on this episode of Offspring Podcast. We're very happy to have you with us here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. So as a brief question, could you please give a short introduction to who you are and what you currently do? Mm-hmm. So uh, I'm Asif Akhtar, a director at the Max Planck Institute of Immunobiology and Epigenetics. Uh, I am interested in epigenetic research, how chromosomes function, and how our cells, despite having the same amount of genetic material, interpret this information differently in different types of cell types. Uh, This is the basic core question that we are addressing using different model systems, uh, using primarily flies, but more recently, mouse uh, and human systems. And in addition to your research, you're also a new vice president of the Max Planck Society. So how did you go from researcher to your current administrative position? Yeah, of course, it is a great honor to have this position and it's a great responsibility uh, in front of me. Uh, Over the years, I have been not only engaged in doing uh, research, but I have been very interested in also the Max Planck Society as a whole. Uh, because it is really a compendium of outstanding scientists that, you know, make up the the bulk of of what we do uh, in the society. Um, And over the years, uh, I begin to appreciate, you know, what makes this big engine work. And um, so it's a great honor to be in this position where you can actually now also contribute towards shaping the future of the society. So it's a great challenge, and I'm looking forward to living this challenge, but also continuing the passion for research that I have. So what were your uh, previous career steps uh, before you arrived at your current position? So yeah. as far as I remember, you were quite the international person. Uh, and could you just give us a quick introduction in where you were before and so on? So let's start from the beginning. <laughs> I was born in Pakistan, uh, but have studied in Pakistan, in United Arab Emirates, in France, and in the UK. So my family was moving um, in different countries because of my father's job um, as a banker. Um, and that's why we moved with him. But this was really a fantastic opportunity to see different cultures and different societies. It makes you much more um, you know, aware of the different cultures, makes you, you broaden your horizons. Uh, so my primary school education was done primarily in Pakistan and in France. But I always followed the English system of education and hence went to the UK to do my university and then followed 
by my PhD at Imperial Cancer Research Fund, which is now called the Crick Institute. Uh, so following the PhD, uh, of course, just like all of you, I was also thinking of where to go to my nearest, next career step. Um, and uh, EMBL caught my attention. Um, and so I came um, to Heidelberg uh, to do my postdoc uh, in the lab of Peter Becker. And then from there, I actually went to Munich because EMBL group leader positions are these nine-year positions. So my group leader was moving from Heidelberg to Munich. So I moved with him and finished my postdoc uh, in Munich. And then actually got a group, group leader position back at EMBL and was there for almost nine years. Um, and this was followed by my recruitment at the Max Planck Institute uh, of immunobiology and epigenetics. Uh, and since 2013, I'm a director at uh, the Max Planck Institute of Immunobiology and Epigenetics. And since this year, uh, the vice president of the Max Planck Society. So it sounds also for me uh, an amazing career track, but I have to say that you know it, it has not been all rosy all the way along. It has been a lot of hard work in front of, behind me and in front of me, so. <laughs> So what you said actually leads us directly into our next question. So you mentioned that you had to go through, as a PI, through a lot of difficulties and hardships before you arrive at a certain position. So could you briefly explain to us which difficulties you had to face bef and you had to overcome before you became the director? Mm -hmm. or yeah, so I think, you know, hardships and uh, are not unique to being already at PI. I think they already begin at the time of the PhD. Uh, you know, science on the one side is fascinating because you are on the way to discover something you don't know. But at the same time, this, you know, going into the unknown also leads you to a very difficult situation also for your future career because you don't know whether it's going to be top or flop at the end of your PhD. So that's already the hardship you begin with this. Uh, and of course, how the PhD goes, uh, you know, depending on how you are uh, going forward with this can lead to you do going forward in an academic career path or you have the choice then to go into non-academic um, non routes, for example, going into industry uh, or otherwise. Um, and then following, again, of this unknown uh, outcome of your postdoc, you may or may not uh, be eligible to get a group leader position. So, you know, there is a lot of uncertainties along the ways, and I did not uh, follow uh, a particularly unusual career path. These uncertainties were also in front of me as a PhD student. I also felt that maybe I was not good enough for the job and always also thought of going into different areas as I was finishing my PhD, going into the postdoc. But I think what is very important is that you know, rather than focusing on what didn't go wrong, what did go wrong or where you were not good enough, I think what we should do as young scientists is to think of, of what can go well and, and keep a positive attitude towards all these next steps because you're not alone in facing these problems. We have all faced that, uh, these problems. But I think the right attitude makes somebody a winner uh, in a situation which is highly competitive. So this was also my case. You know, I always kept a positive spirit and, and thought at the time when I finished my PhD, you know, let's give a postdoc a chance. And if I'm not good enough, then I can always change to a non-academic career path. Uh, and that's what I would always advise. Try to give yourself self a second chance. Don't back off if the first, at the first hurdle you are, you are struggling. Okay. Then, of course, depends on what what you will do as a postdoc, and, and in my case, uh, you know, I was very lucky. I also worked very hard to, to achieve the next step. But again, it was, again, came to me as a surprise that I had these possibilities. Um, and getting a job at EMBL at the time was a dream job to get. But again, you know, again, different challenges uh, come your way when you are reaching different stages of, of career. And of course, for me at the time when I started my lab was also the time when I was facing this, this challenging decision whether to have a family or not. And, um, and here having uh, you know, a kindergarten at EMBL was very helpful. Uh, so I had uh, my first daughter. I mean, 
I have a daughter and a son uh, at EMBL one year after I started my my group leader position. So you can imagine having a family and having a young lab is a very challenging task for a woman. Um, you're already feeling insecure about whether you can make it even without having a family <laughs> in front of you. But then having having a child at home is it's, it's another category of, of, of problematics. And actually, in my case, my husband was, was living in Belgium at the time. So being home alone with the child and leading a lab was uh, not trivial. But I have to say that the, my lab was super supportive and the environment in which I was doing my research was super supportive. And that made all the difference for me to go forward in these challenging times. And, and that's the reason why when I moved uh, at the Max Planck here in Freiburg, we also invested in, in furthering uh, you know, child care opportunities because this makes all the difference to uh, having uh, really taking care of, of children and, and, uh, and having a research career. So if the one advice I can give you is that don't compromise on your, your family life if you want to have a research career. You have so much more balanced perspective in front of you if you can juggle both. It is true that it is not a trivial road. It's not that everything goes hunky-dory. There are times when you will feel totally left alone. Um, but you again need to have this fighting spirit in you and believe in yourself to go forward. And I think this was very helpful for me. Uh, knowing actually that even if your paper is rejected, my daughter is there to love me back. <laughs> I think this was, this was at times very, very helpful, at least for me to gather my energy. Okay, oh, that sounds really nice. Just a quick question to there, because I mean, as you said, like having a family and uh, a young lab is super tough. So how was your time management uh, for it? Like, how much did you say, okay, I'm gonna work like eight hours in the lab, then go back home and focus only on my family? Or how did you manage this? Yeah, I think, you know, time management remains a challenge all through your career. Uh, this is, of course, particularly challenging if you have a family uh, in addition to this. So uh, rather than working night and day, which I was doing before the kids were born, I had a much more structured time with which I actually spent the time in the lab. And I always, if I can manage, make the point to go home for dinner. And then once the kids are in bed, I start working back again in the evening. So, uh, you know, time management, you have to be flexible. You know, if you have a family, kids can be sick overnight. You just have to, to, uh, to remain flexible in these terms. So it makes you very efficient. Actually, I don't usually wait for deadlines on the last day. I'm actually done much quicker because you never know what's going what's to happen. doesn't mean that I will meet every deadline, but I always have this mindset that you have to be efficient. So I think, you know, having a family also gives you this, this additional asset of time management because you have different priorities you have to deal with. That doesn't mean that you will compromise on the science or you compromise on the family, I think structured timings will just help you also execute uh, and multitask at different times. And of course, depending on the time of your lab, time of the projects, uh, you know, you need more intense lab work and you need more intense family time if, if the kids are ill. And I have to say here, uh, a, a good partner is absolutely essential. If you have a partner that will support you in the background, that makes all the difference. And I had the pleasure to have that so far. That sounds really, really great. And I I didn't realize that uh, you had a kindergarten like kind of established at the MPI in Freiburg. And that's I I imagine just must be great for the parent for the parent researchers yeah. at the institute. And so as the first international female vice president of the society, do you feel like you're now under any kind of pressure to bring about that kind of change in in your term do you feel like there's an expectation to do something big like that i think you know being the vice president of a society uh like the max Planck society you will feel under pressure so or so being a woman or a man is not specially <laughs> leading you to extra pressure you want to do well and i am motivated to do well in this society so i think this is very important that we take gender out of this of doing well for the society independently of that. However, being a female and having gone through these career steps and being very sensitive to what it uh, means to have a family and career, of course, I'm very supportive of, of programs and hopefully developing further ideas 
how we can help support the young scientists in their you know, hurdles that they will cross and how we can make this manageable. We need a society that is understanding to the different steps of careers. But this is, is actually a question that goes beyond the Max Planck Society. It's actually society as a whole uh, that we need to change. It's not just simply that we as scientists are usually very accommodating, but you know, are the neighbors uh, understanding of, of what's happening in your families or in young families in this particular stages? So I think we need a cultural change to understand that both careers are as important if in a family both parents want to have a career and the understanding that that both parents need to contribute and we need supportive structures to enable that. The easier it is for people to to go through these paths because of these uh, different infrastructures, the easier it is for people to go forward uh, having both of these aspects. And I think one should really invest in both if one wants. And so to try and do this, uh, society-wide, like, do you think the first step is more just as simple as raising awareness and trying to change really the culture? Or do you think that it's, we're already at a point where we can implement some kind of concrete changes, like every institute has a kindergarten? What, where are we? I, I think we have to act in multiple fronts. There is not one answer that will address this very complex question. because, But ob- obviously the right attitude will make all the difference. I think for me, having childcare facilities in the two institutions that have been made the difference for my two kids because my second child was born at the Max Planck in, in Freiburg. Uh, uh, so, you know, having, having uh, childcare on site was fantastic. But, you know, there are other options uh, that people can take. You may not want to have, a, you know, a kindergarten. You may need Targetsmutter or some other form of, of, of help that you may get. So depending on the situation, of course, there is no one solution that will fit uh, all options. You may have a partner that is at home taking care uh, of, of the family. So again, um, many possibilities can exist, How which will be solutions that are different to every family. But I think definitely we need this positive attitude that investment in this area is not uh, money lost, but we're actually gaining exactly this uh, very balanced attitude towards work and life for the future. But at the same time, as I told you, that this is a societal uh, you know, issue. We just need more role models. We need more uh, families where you know, both parents are contributing positively for people to see that it is possible. Uh, and again, as I said, this it's for any job. It's not especially about scientists. You know, in any uh, partnership where both partners are working, is it difficult for a family? And I think that's why this balanced uh, at home has to begin uh, at the first place if you want to change it at the societal level. Mm-hmm. So uh, you've been the new vice president of the Max Planck Society for a few weeks now. So I have a two-part question. So how have the first few weeks been? And how much of your weekly schedule or the time of your weekly schedule do you spend your work as a vice president? Yeah. So I have to say that, uh, you know, it is very exciting to be in this position. Um, at the same time, it is a lot of work in front of me. Since uh, it has been just uh, a few weeks since I'm in the position officially, of course, there is a, a lot of influx of information that I'm absorbing, adjusting, and getting informed. But I have to say here, we have a fantastic team in the general administration helping me adjust to the new role. So this is great. I get a lot of help. Uh, uh, In terms of time management, I think this will be a moving target all through my uh, vice presidency um, because there are times where you really need organizationally for decision-making process time. And there will be times where it will be very intense for paper submissions and, and moving the projects forward. And I, you know, it, Again, this is something that that I deal with right now on a weekly or a two-weekly basis. And I hope that in, in a few months, I can better predict how it's going to be. But right now, it's it's very intense times uh, on both fronts because the lab is doing really well and there are lots of things coming forward uh, through the Max Planck Society. And, you know, the biomedical section has, uh, you know, almost 30 institutes. So you can imagine... There is a lot of input from various institutions uh, coming my way. 
But it's very exciting because, again, people are very accommodating and very welcoming, and that makes the job much, much more pleasant uh, than being at a chore. Okay. Well, that sounds good. I mean, one thing that uh, you also, I think, mentioned in your interview um, was that uh, the this um, word of excellence is kind of hard to define. So now we wanted to ask you what, would you say is an excellent PhD student, an excellent postdoc, or an excellent PI? Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the Max Planck Society, it's very important that scientific excellence is the prime target we want to have. I think you guys won't be there without this. And that starts already, as I, as I told you, with the programs that we have right at the beginning, be it the PhD program, the postdocs, or, or the group leaders. I think there is, again, not one a uh, bill that fits all. You need excellence at different times and you need different qualifications and expertise at different times of your career. At the time when you're a PhD student, what you need is to be able to listen, but also try to reach independence. It's, uh, it's a difficult balance to achieve. And this is the time you can be very creative because what you're doing is all for you. Okay. Uh, but but having this balance of being, you know, moving from early on in your PhD to be, let's say, much more dependent to your PI to moving towards the end where you're much more independent is a great transformation in a scientist. And I just remember this for myself. I started as a naive PhD student. Uh, I was still actually quite naive when I finished, <laughs> but I was much better prepared to do a postdoc and and. At least the time between the PhD and postdoc, I really thought what I did not do so well that I don't want to repeat in the postdoc times. But at the postdoc time, of course, the independence becomes much more dominant. You want to be able to put forward some of your ideas. You want to discuss with your supervisor much more whether this is a good way to go forward or not. But again, there, you know, a good postdoc will be a good harmony of, of exchange of ideas, discussions that you will uh, lead to development of a project. In, in, in the situation where you now go to a PI, this is, again, an overwhelming task because instead of now you, you uh, depend on somebody's idea and hopefully also you know, relying on somebody to catch your fall, now you are the one who has to catch the fall of all the others. So it is not trivial and nobody prepares you for that so easily. So again, another set of, of skills are needed to become a good PI. Having great cell science and nature papers in a postdoc doesn't automatically make you a good PI. Okay? Uh, and, and that's where good institutions also make a difference uh, in terms of what is being published versus what are you proposing and where you want to go. Depending on so all the fields, It's not always uh, easy to, uh, you know, uh, publish in trendy journals. But the question is, do you have a vision uh, where you want to go forward? Uh, so I think, you know, in terms of excellence, of course, scientific excellence will mature as you will move forward in your career. But additional skills are needed along the way to, to make you go forward, um, you know, successfully uh, in an academic career, career path. And I think one thing that is super important, in my opinion, is really very important to have interpersonal skills. You need to be a people's person to understand the problems. You need to not necessarily be a buddy of the, of the PhD student or a postdoc, but have the sixth sense to know, is this something that is bothering this person or not? Can I get closer to the problem? Because only then you can solve the problem. And sometimes, the you know... Uh, It's not easy for PhD students or postdocs to come forward, in, in, for example, to a group leader or a director, because it's sometimes so daunting to go to these guys that are all so big and famous, uh, etc. Right at the beginning, it's it's much harder than maybe towards the end, and uh, and so a good relationship with the PI or a PI that is approachable makes all the difference, because when you had a good relationship, then it is when you, you will be able to go at difficult times um, to the person uh, and discuss these problems. So 
you talk about the relationship being really important, but a relationship takes time to build. And so you also mentioned, you know, during the beginning, it can be really hard maybe for a student to go to their supervisor with, with an issue because, you know, that relationship isn't there, or maybe at that point, the supervisor doesn't know the student that well. So it's very hard to recognize. Like, what do you, do you think there's anything that can be done early on to really try and in- increase the comfort level students have or build that relationship early on? Yeah, I think, you know, you clap with two hands. I think both sides have to work on this. So the students have to be proactive in approaching the PI, especially early on when it is harder. Uh, and the PI has to be proactive and approach the students to ease them into, into, into this phase. But here I have to say that the teams make an absolute difference. If you have a supportive lab environment, an infrastructure where people are happy and interactive, this uh, phase of uh, being uh, afraid or, or, or afraid to approach the PI eases out because other people will, will encourage you to say, it's not a problem, go and talk to Asifa. You know, and, and she will have an answer, or at least if I don't have an answer, I will know who to, who to address. And I think it is also important for students to know that PIs don't always have all the perfect answers either. At least some of us. As some of us may think they have all the perfect answers. I don't definitely have all the perfect answers, but I'll try my best to find a good way forward uh, to, to reach that goal. And that's why I think that a PhD is really a team effort. In my opinion, uh, you know, the success of a PhD student is ultimately linked to the success of the PI or a success of a postdoc is ultimately linked to the success of the PI. So I think, you know, uh, this is very important for for students and postdocs, at least in my lab, to know that, you know, you know, I cannot sit in my office and be successful if my team is not motivated and, and, and working together in bringing the ideas forward. So I think... You know, this spirit, if you get this, and this starts already at the interview level. When you are at the interview and you're talking to me or talking to your PI and you have this feeling that I can trust this person to go forward, I think that's the match that you you already make. Doesn't mean that this will always work. And of course, it's much harder at times when things are not working. Um, But this is, again, where, you know, your own proactive attitude, your positive spirit will help you. The other thing that is quite important is that, which people also sometimes uh, forget when they're young, is that it's not about the one big goal that is your success. There are lots of little successes you have to be happy about to make this big goal achievable. A PhD takes about three to four years. You know, nobody is expecting you, at least not me in my lab, to have your first story already ready to go after a few months. I mean, it's un. It's not a sprint, it's a marathon we are running in this time frame. And I think that, you know, you should split the pressure with that time frame. And I think sometimes it's difficult for for young scientists to realize this, especially because when you are coming into a PhD, you have just finished a master's, which is only six months long. You know, the overall project composition is different. The aim and the, the risk taking in the projects are totally different to what you will do in in a PhD. And of course, the riskier the riskier the project, the more gain you have. But that also bring uncertainty into the projects as well. Uh, so it's it's you know it's a juggling balance, uh, and I know that it is a lot to juggle, but I have to say it's the best job in the world. I mean, I wouldn't want to change to be a scientist. I mean, to to know what what you will discover next is so exciting. You you know what we do every day is changing all the time. It's dynamic all the time. Uh, I would never want to be somebody else. Uh, I think this this is this passion is fantastic, and I think this is what makes us us burning for science. You need a special category of people that cannot stop thinking about science. You're going home. You're thinking about science. You're in the lab thinking about science. You're excited about what is about to happen. And of course, that's why you go through this roller coaster of emotions because expectations is so high. What if this worked? <laughs> um, and um, and that's the reason why I think you know this this interaction with the lab members and interaction with the PI is very important because you really shouldn't have these huge roller coasters. You know, you don't have to have the blue fire every time if you go to a rope park. <laughs> 
<laughs> no, it's really great that you're so passionate about uh, being a scientist. Uh, uh, motivation, or uh, it gives us a lot of motivation. So one thing I'd like to actually touch upon is, uh, so you, you mentioned basically that there's like ups and downs, right? So I think for the good parts, usually there's no uh, no conflict between PIs and PhD students. It's usually the bad uh, times yeah. when there is. And now with the recent cases of power abuse and also with the PhD net survey that was recently published, or the uh, results at least, um, there are still some cases of like uh, bullying and so on happening. So you were mentioning also that PIs need some of these people skills. So how do you think would it be best to give uh, new PIs the opportunity to learn those if before they were only in their lab, they had their nature cell science papers and so on? Yeah. No, I think you touch on a very, very important topic. And I think the, the society has already realized, I think society as a whole, but also, of course, the Max Planck society, uh, that it goes hand in hand by being an outstanding scientist and being an outstanding per people's person. So we have already, uh, since a few years now, implemented changes already in our recruitment processes so that we are also looking for, for leadership skills in addition to your scientific excellence. I think the next generation of scientists that we will hire in the Max Planck Society are hopefully trained in both. But as I told you, the usual career path normally doesn't prepare you well. But if you know your weaknesses and your strength, you can work on that. And I think within the society, we, we are implementing changes to be awareing, aware of, of the new hires, what are their strengths and weaknesses, so that we can help them train uh, into where they could be weaker um, and where they can have a, a potential to develop. And I think this is fantastic. Most people actually embrace that Uh, because, again, this is not automatically done in many academic um, institutions. And I think we are uh, going forward with full speed because if we want to follow excellence. We want to follow excellence in both levels. And, of course, the, the cases that have been in the press in the last years, of course, have been very damaging and absolutely unacceptable to go forward with this. And even more that we need to, to bring this forward with much more momentum. Times are changing You know, some things that were maybe acceptable to behave uh, 50 years ago, I mean, they were never acceptable to begin with, but they were tolerated maybe 50 years ago, are no longer tolerable right now. And rightly so. I think this, the next generation of scientists are much stronger than maybe we were 20, 30 years ago. And I think this is the attitude we need to have to be able to listen to the young scientists and say, what do we do really good so we can do this better? And what do we don't do so good? And that's why these surveys are outstanding because this makes us help improve the society. So if you want to be, you know, a society that is dynamic and moving forward with times, we have to listen to the young scientists and see what we can do better. Being conservative will not help us in the long run. We will lose our scientific edge uh, on many fronts. And of course, as PhD students and postdocs, you are the next generation of scientists we want to hire hopefully as future directors or future vice presidents of, of the Max Planck Society. So, uh, you know, you are probably in the uh, PhD programs of the Max Planck, the IMPRESS programs. So we also implement within these programs also training, uh, you know, how to write a paper, what uh, the, the how to be a good uh, scientist, different kind of program, different schools have different kind of courses so it, the training already begins at the level of, of starting your PhD already, ideally even, even before that. But it should not stop having a position as a director. And I think that's the reason the Planck Academy, which is the new initiative in the society, is doing an outstanding job in, in generating new programs so that the new directors uh, will also get benefit from that in improving these skills. And so... You mentioned now that when you recruit new PIs, you don't just look at the papers, you look for leadership skills. And so I'm wondering what sort of things now should postdocs be thinking about when they're doing their training to actually be prepared for the leadership and what's the Max Planck Society doing for its postdocs mm -hmm. to prepare them to be leaders? Yeah, so postdocs are also actually a very active bunch of, uh, of young scientists within our society uh, and actually look forward in, in a few months to having discussions with them as well. 
And I think, again, there are also programs uh, for them that are being initiated, trainings, how to be a PI, how to write grants. So there are also initiatives on that front because going from postdoc to the PI, you need different kind of trainings. So again, there are different kind of programs either already on the way or uh, on the way to be uh, executed uh, so that we can make uh, the next generation of men and women competent for uh, you know, being uh, a group leader or maybe going out into the into the industry. I think what is important is that you know the PhD students that are are in the society right now. You know, if they follow a career in the academic path, this is fantastic. But this is also fantastic to go out of academic science and find your way elsewhere. I think we need to prepare you for life in general. If this is academia, is wonderful. If it is uh, non-academia, that is also wonderful. I think a scientist, you know, you know, integrates, observes, uh, and looks into the problem, so, and looks into solving uh, so, uh, problems in multiple ways. So this prepares you for many aspects of life, uh, not just following the next step, being a postdoc or a PI. So I think you know a, a good time during your PhD will 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 benefit you in many ways. And I think that's why it's a responsibility of the Max Planck Society to have scientists that are competent at multiple levels when they leave. Okay, so you have been asking me a lot of questions, but as an incoming vice president that is very interested in the future development of young careers, I would like to listen to you. What do you think will be uh, aspects within the society we can improve? What will be your views of what we do well and, and where we can do better? This will be also great feedback for me. Mm -hmm. So I think we can take turns. Let's start with Nico. Okay. So generally, I think, I mean, I, I'm a big fan of the Max Planck Society. I have to admit, I'm having an awesome time here. And one thing that I think is also maybe not only a problem in the Max Planck Society, but in uh, science in general, is that I feel like if you go outside of science or academia, you're kind of a bit of a failure, which should not be the case. There's like so many other interesting jobs out there that are just as good as being a scientist. And I feel like a lot of uh, also master students or bachelor students don't know what it entails to be a PI. Uh, so, um, yeah, this is, I think, one of the big problems. And that's why also so many people want to go into science, because this is a success, as you said it before. This is being a PI is like a big thing. And, yeah, not knowing what it actually means to do that uh, is a problem. Yeah, I, I can totally relate to that. And that's the reason why I was telling you earlier that we need to make the next generation of scientists competent and welcoming for either career path they take. Of course, what, what you're in right now is very familiar and it's, it's the tag that, track that you see going forward. But I think I have to say that over the last few years, there is a, a, a systematic change in also in the perception of, of how do we tackle this problem. There are many more courses and, and programs that are uh, are actually uh, done within also, as I told you, for the Impress Research Schools uh, to make people aware what can be done. And I think we have to not stigmatize going out of the, of the academia as a failure. I think if your strength is going somewhere else, it's fantastic. And I think this is what, what, why it is very important that you should be happy with what you're doing. It doesn't matter what the others think. I think if you are satisfied with what you're doing, this is the ultimate goal you want to achieve because that's when you will be happy. You don't want to be a PI just to please somebody else. Um, so just a quick follow-up. Um, so because I think on the one hand side, I agree that you should not think that other people are, or influence you. But if you get support from them, it's easier to uh, believe in yourself, I guess, in this case. And also, uh, as a side note there, it was like a couple of years ago, we had a um, lunch uh, with a PI, and he was asking us which career tracks we want to have. It was like, I think, two years ago. And most of the male PhD students were saying they want to stay in academia, and I think all of the female ones were saying they want to go outside of it. So... Well, so this was actually very recently, so I think it's still somewhat of a problem. Like, yes. 
Yeah, I can I can totally understand this. I think this is the reason why I think it's very important that we look into the issue of gender diversity much much more actively. You know, men and women at the stage of of postdoc and and um, going into the group leader face several challenges. I think men and women are facing similar challenges. But of course, as a nature of of having to have a have a child, the women are generally, of course, much more affected than women. And that's the reason why I was telling you to enable that women don't have these doubts. We need a good supporting structure, family structure to do that. Because, you know, there is absolutely no reason why both cannot have a career path going forward. So that's the reason why we, we should enable uh, that the, it's okay for, for societally that it is okay to have a career. And also be encouraging to the women that it's okay to have a career and the wish to have a family. I think that's the only way we can go forward. So, of course, I will put all my energy uh, to help support that cause. Mm -hmm. So uh, my answer to Asifa's question, I think we've gone a bit far no, away from No, it'll be great. The... No, no, we can come back to that. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So my answer is actually not in a career direction or it's not, it's not necessarily in that direction. It's more about like communication and uh, ability to be able to reach people. So I, I'm, I'm a strong proponent of uh, science communication and also trying to, let's say within the Max Planck Society, trying to reach people on different topics. And I kind of feel what really affects me is the amount of grapevine that one has to climb in order to reach a certain uh, person or a certain thing to get a certain task done. And and also, this could also be an effect of like the, the, the lack of digitalization also and also the lack of certain direct paths to certain things. But I mean, I understand that it's it may be necessary in some cases, but sometimes it feels like it's bureaucracy for the sake of bureaucracy. And I think that's what really bothers me most more than anything else. I think the answer to that is, again, it's a super important topic you just brought up. We need to work on communication at all fronts. We can always do better. And I think mm -hmm. improving communication also takes away a lot of anxiety that people may have and also gives you the direct form of, of, of interaction with people as well. So you can never beat directly talking to people. Exactly. Of course, when you come into the society... Sometimes it may look very bureaucratic, uh, rightly so, but I think some processes we have to go forward, of course, as public payers' money that, uh, that, that we have, so we have a responsibility within the society. I uh, completely agree. But at the same time, I think this is one of those areas where I also think that we need to push forward to improve and continually work on helping uh, communication because this will make your life easier and it will mm -hmm. make also the life of, of generally the Max Planck Society much easier. Nobody wants to put unnecessarily roads on your on your way, uh, sorry, stones on your way. So we all want the same for you and us to be successful. Yeah. So how can we achieve this in the best possible manner? And digi digitalization is the key for that. And I think we will be pushing forward to make us much more modern than we are already. Um, and I think this is obviously the way to go forward. Uh, and, and use different forms of communication to reach out different categories of scientists and non-scientists. Mm -hmm. Hence, we are here doing yeah, the podcast. The podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also, I kind of uh, like wanted to mention that with the pandemic, it sort of also lit a fire under people's uh, uh, behinds, <laughs> which is sort of pushing them to use more digital forms of communication and less analog methods and also I think this is important and I think it's yeah. it's a good step in the right direction. Yeah, totally. I think the, the pandemic has really transformed in many ways our lives. Uh, and, and one of those is indeed appreciating that you can work also away from home and be as productive. Of course, depending on the job, you can not always be away from home. Uh, so I think, you know, we move forward with, with changing times and, uh, and, and adapt. And I think this is very important that we have the adaptability and the flexibility as we move forward. Uh, so, you know, the Max Planck Society of tomorrow may look very different, more uh, for even more forward looking that we are right now. Uh, 
Um, and obviously, we want to be stronger, even stronger after the pandemic than before the pandemic. And But of course, we need adjustments and we need everybody to work as a team here. We are all in the same boat. Uh, the problems we are say, facing in Freiburg are no different to Dresden or Frankfurt or, or Munich. Uh, so I think we have to work together, show compassion and so show some pas- uh, patience because the problems are not solved. Things are very dynamically changing. And so we have to come up with solutions, sometimes very spontaneously, which also sometimes may look that we are slow in the process, but we have to be careful that we don't, uh, you know, do anything wrong along the way. Um, I'll answer your question for what I think the general administration could think about. Um, and for me, that would be like the kind of the more around the culture of science and particularly mental health when you were talking about positivity being so important as a scientist and viewing your days more as a marathon and not a sprint and not thinking really about the destination. I think that at least talking to a lot of my colleagues that too many of us lose sight of that. And this often leads to feelings of like the number of people who say they feel like they're unqualified despite going through like quite a rigorous interview process or you know, like they, they're not smart enough or don't belong or they, they need to get this paper out and, you know, none of my experiments are working and they're not really stopping to like enjoy each day coming in the lab, doing their experiments and that, you know, a part of that is failing, is not getting real results or the experiment not working. And like that troubleshooting is all a part of being a scientist. And I, I think I hear a lot of people thinking if I'm not generating data I'm not working. And so that failed experiment, like that's time wasted. I need to make up for that. And I think that, you know, when scientists aren't functioning at like their peak mental capacity, like this is a job where we need to think a lot. And so I often think that these problems feel a little bit swept under the rug right now. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think we have to be more aware. I mean, these problems we are facing everywhere. Max Planck Society's institutes are no different to other institutions as well. And the problems that that you are raising are problems I was also facing as a PhD student myself. So, you know, generations of of people have gone through this. And I think it's important that we don't forget as we go up the ladder that the young generation is still facing these problems. And I think we need to show understanding. And indeed, uh, you know, having a culture that is open for discussion, open to, to address the problems is actually very important. And I think we should be working on that front because it doesn't help the situation if you feel totally alone. And I think that's a very important aspect, for example, also of the IMPRESS programs, that in addition to your supervisor, you have a thesis advisory committee that also look at your progress and independently of your supervisor, go over your progress And I very much hope that in different institutions, this is taken seriously because this is a very important forum for the student, but also as a PI to identify problems easier on either side and and help solve them. And I think we should take these uh, these approaches to actually continuously work on exactly this problem. When things are going well, everybody is happy. This is, you don't ever talk about. And honestly speaking, you know, it's probably just a few months of extraordinarily uh, great work that will lead you to a paper with years of frustrations behind uh, of failed experiments that didn't work. So, you know, what is important to realize is a failed experiment, if it's not just a technical problem, is also telling you something. You may need to revise your hypothesis, uh, etc. So I think it's important to realize that, you know, if things work out and your hypothesis is great, it's fantastic. But at times, you may have to revise your hypothesis and it's telling you something different. So we, as, as, as a team in this case, student, postdocs, or the PI, should go forward with various options in which we are going forward with our hypothesis, because this will also lead you to be less frustrated. Because if this, there is only one answer and there is no other answer, maybe that's a, it's not the right goal you are going forward. And of course, that will lead to a lot of frustration for the student as well as PI. So I think we need to just generally be open at, at, at various fronts 
to go forward. And from the society perspective, of course, I would very much like to go forward with this positive attitude and, and give really people the first possibilities as well, nurturing locally at individual institutions that we are more open to discussing problems and have this mindset of, of solving problems rather than hiding them under the rug. Uh, if you can discuss them, you can. it's the first step to solving them. If you don't know, you cannot solve a problem. Now that's completely right. So one thing that I'd like to follow up on is you mentioned before that um, a PhD takes like three to four uh, years, which I, I'm... More longer. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so that's actually my point. Uh, so I think that a lot of PhD, it depended on the field, of course. Um, so it takes like, I don't know, five years even. And um, so comparing also the PhDs nowadays to like, I don't know, 50 years ago, I also feel like you need to know a lot of different things. So my background, for example, is biochemistry. But I feel like I also need to know about optics to build a microscope. I need to know statistics to do the proper analysis. I need to know programming to actually implement the analysis. So do you think that um, a PhD should not be, like I don't know, powered through within three years? Because then it's like a really long sprint, but actually given the proper time to like fully develop the skills and then uh, finalize the project. Yeah, I mean, again, very nice point that you bring forward again every phd is unique and every phd time frame is unique but on average if you look in the biomedical section of course very few people are done within three years maybe if you're doing maybe computational work it's, it's maybe easier but if you're doing experimental work and depending on also which model organisms you're, you're doing using it takes four to five years easily to uh, to be able to complete a phd And of course, if this is coupled with getting a publication, the entire review process at times can take a while. I think that is very important. Another aspect that has changed, and I totally sympathize with you, uh, is that papers become much more complex, much more interdisciplinary. You need to be, uh, you know, or at least the paper will entail many different technologies, many different uh, expertise, uh, if you really want to go Uh, you know, to the top journals. So, of course, that also brings an extra pressure. Um, and uh, the students feel under pressure to be expert in more than one thing. But again, I have to say that maybe compared to, you know, at the time when I was doing my PhD to now, international collaborations or collaborations from within the lab are much, much more dominant and very well supported uh, Otherwise, you also cannot go forward. There is nobody who can do everything alone these days. There's just so much just in investment in technology uh, and investment in getting all these different skills. You know, if you're doing biochemistry and at the same time you have to be doing super resolution microscopy or doing genome-wide analysis and bioinformatics is just not doable by one person. They're only 24 hours a day. So I think, so this is where your interpersonal skills and, and your, your, um, you know, developing your uh, interaction with other people becomes so much more powerful that you can actually share expertise, share the knowledge, and, and move forward as a team together to reach the overall goal. So maybe you are expert in one thing and maybe half expert in something else and the other people the same way. And I think this makes you also move forward in a slightly different manner to maybe 50 years ago where you had one problem and that was the only thing you did. Uh, again, th this is not applying to every situation, but I think on average uh, in the biomedical section, as far as I can see, there is much, much more uh, interdisciplinarity and it's actually fantastic. You get view from angles you would have only dreamed about before. And and I think as PhD students, you should also not feel that you have an ex to be an expert on everything. This is far too much pressure you're feeling for yourself. I think if you can do one thing really well and then collaborate with others to, to help you achieve your goal, this is a fantastic uh, a possibility. I think, I think students and postdocs right now under also put themselves under so much pressure. Uh, you know, the pressure was always there also for me, but, you know, I didn't let myself drown in the pressure. Just take one step at a time 
and see what you can do next. I think if you if you too much worry about this gold medal, you will never even reach the first step. I think it's important to do well where you are right now, achieve achieve that and see what you can do with the next step. And as you go into the next step, be open to both possibilities every time. This way you will be positively surprised if things come your way rather than disappointed that you didn't get your goal. <laughs> At least that has been my recipe for life. I have always been surprised what me, you know, uh, and then you try to do your best for the next step and say, let's see what happens if I do this well. And, and uh, so far this has worked for me. So I can only say that, um, you know, try to, to, to keep the positive attitude. This is much, much more important than a singular result over the course of whatever few months that you may not get. Okay. Just one quick follow-up to this. Uh, how is it in your lab? Do you have like a very interdisciplinary lab? And also, do you have a lot of collaborations? Yes, both. So I have a very interdisciplinary lab. I'm very proud. Uh, we have, I think, almost 13, 14 different nationalities. So it's totally international. Uh, lab, which I'm very proud of. They are very motivated young scientists. Um, I have students and postdocs, so basically uh, both, and a team of really outstanding technicians that help really uh, encompass and help basically as pillars to stabilize the lab. Uh, I think that's that's very, very important. And of course, the students are helped by postdocs, Uh, to help them get going. But I think it's important that people are self-motivated to go forward. If I have to motivate you, you know, this is not going to work. And yeah, I'm always amazed by the motivation of people in my lab, I have to say. <laughs> in terms of interdisciplinarity, yes. You know, as I told you, that primarily we have been using FLY as a model system. But my move from EMBL to the, to the Max Planck Society enabled me really to expand into mouse models. Uh, to really look at uh, evolutionary comparisons of what the X chromosome regulation, which um, I really study, uh, what aspect of this are conserved and not conserved. And we have now gone all the way to the humans. Uh, we have actually defined a new syndrome uh, where one of the proteins that uh, we work on is mut mutated de novo in patients. So the lab expands this portfolio of model systems, but we also do a lot of biochemistry. Uh, all the way to genome-wide analysis as a chromatin and epigeneticist, we want to look at, at, at the bigger picture. But uh, of course, to understand the mechanism, you have to boil down to individual molecules. Uh, but it gives you a big spectrum of, of looking at, uh, at this. And of course, imaging plays a, a beautiful role. If you can see it, you believe it. So I, I love that. And X chromosome biology is very visual. You can see the X chromosome light up uh, with all these proteins is a beautiful system to understand how specificity is achieved uh, at visual level, but also at local level, looking at chromosome wide regulation versus individual genes. So, you know, my attitude is if we need it, we do it. And I'll make sure you, if you are in my lab, you get the, the, the right resources and the right mindset to go forward. If we need to collaborate, we will collaborate. Of course, there is, we want to be at the forefront And if we can team up with outstanding people that do things better than us to help us go forward this way, why not? I mean, um, after all, we are all, you know, needing to, to understand the problem better and how we can achieve this uh, multiple ways. And I think we should be, you know, we should be open. And so... To really put together like a multidisciplinary lab to really approach problems from all angles, like attracting talent at all stages is a challenging task. So to assemble these teams, what do you think makes the Max Planck Society an attractive place for researchers to work in Germany? Yeah, I think Max Planck Society is the best organization you can do your research in. First, I think we have... Um, You know, the focus on basic research is great because I think this is, you know, putting the money on the right target. If we understand basic mechanisms, we will be able to solve many, many problems that come forward, uh, especially solving diseases. You cannot build, 
you know, a table if you don't understand what are the components you need to, to build it. So I think we definitely need to invest into basic research um, for sure. Then at the same time, of course, you know, the Max Planck Society provides outstanding infrastructure to do the leading research. It's an international environment. The institutes are recruiting internationally at all levels, which also caters for people coming from other cultures. You know, science is a beautiful example of, of having no boundaries. You know, we, we are discovering new things as we go forward in science. But, you know, it doesn't matter where you come from, China, or you come from, uh, you know, England or Pakistan, the problems you will be faced in your PhD will be exactly the same. And I think it also bonds all the scientists together. I think it's a fantastic atmosphere in institutes when you have international um, composition of people, but it also makes you much more tolerant. I think sometimes when you hear what's happening around the world, I'm amazed, you know. And I think that's why also as scientists, because we are just naturally catering for internationality, tolerance, and really this open environment, it's our responsibility also to go out into the public and, and propagate this, this tolerance. I think this is very important that we, we go forward with this. And, you know, as a, as a future or as a vice president, talking to the future generation of scientists, I very much hope that your stay in the Max Planck Society will prepare for you, prepare you for exactly those, those aspects. So you can actually also go out and say, Max Planck was the best time of my life. I think this will be fantastic. It has definitely been, uh, you know, a very pleasurable experience for me so far. And I hope it will continue. And, and uh, I think that's the only way we can, we can go forward. Okay. So uh, also, if you look at the international level, so in Germany, of course, many people are aware of the existence of the Max Planck Society and uh, uh, that they are a big organization. But on an international scale... I think there is still a general lack of publicity for the yeah. Max Planck Society. Mm -hmm. So what do you think is the most key factor that people all over the world should know about the Max Planck Society and the general public, not just the scientific uh, uh, people in the scientific field, but the general public? What, what should they know about the Max Planck Society and how do you plan to reach this information to them? I mean, I think that... Uh Max Planck Society is worldwide known, so I, I don't think that it's a society that is, is not known worldwide. But I definitely agree that one can do more to make it even more visible. And I think one contribution to that visibility is to make an effort to make many things we do bilingual. Because, of course, German uh, language, of course, is a barrier for some people to understand what's happening within, within the Max Planck Society. But your, your perception that we are maybe not well known, I would actually disagree because we have some of the top researchers in the world. All the scientific output that we have is, is in English. So people know where the Max Planck stands. Um, and the Max Planck stands for really outstanding basic research. We have top-notch people around the world. And obviously we should make effort to recruit more young talent um, of the next generation to go forward uh, if you want to keep that dy dynamic momentum. I agree with you. One can always do more in, in, in bringing forward uh, our internationality international and having a vice president that is international goals in that direction. So I hope I will positively contribute towards that. Uh, international PhD programs, uh, you know, postdoctoral programs, as well as group leader programs, they're all international already. But definitely, you know, the more we, we can cater, the more, uh, you know, the more the, the word will spread. But I think the best thing we can do, honestly, is to do the best science what we are known for. Because with that really comes also the, the credibility uh, that we deserve uh, mm -hmm. and we have right now in the world. Okay, so one thing uh, I feel like where uh, I completely agree is that the scientists are very international usually at Max Planck Institutes, but one of the things that is not so international, I feel, is the administration. 
So, and I also heard like a lot of people that had had problems with the administration because of communication uh, problems and so on. So how do you think would it be possible to make sure that this uh, communication is better and that people can understand each other, like also culturally? On a yeah, better that's, that's the reason why I was telling you that I think, you know, one contributing factor of sometimes lack of communication and not understanding each other is sometimes a language barrier. So I think what we need to do is help improve that. There are already many efforts that are already made in general administration to make things bilingual. But again, this sometimes very much depends on your local institute as well. So I would very much would be willing to, to, to invest looking deeper. How can we make sure that our communication is better, the communication at every level is bilingual, uh, that we can help bridge this this perception that people have that uh, it is uh, difficult to uh, sometimes interact with the with administration. I think the, the general administration, just generally, but also local administration are trying their best to go forward with all the needs. Remember that, that we come from, we as scientists come from very many different cultures and very many different backgrounds and trainings. And sometimes it's not always easy to understand you what the what what maybe the the administration is trying to to portray or what the scientists are wanting to 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 listen and i think we definitely do, need to work on both sides i think i told you before you clap with two hands you know if there is a problem we need to go forward and solve it but the attitude really of the administration is to be there to help and they are very very helpful um in going forward with many many issues and uh I think the young generation always have to be sometimes a little bit patient uh, because not answers can be easily worked out, especially uh, some of the problems are complex. So I think we need to work on both fronts in that. And I very much hope that I can contribute again, also improving that at local as well as uh, really global level within the society. So the relationship between the scientists of the Max Planck Society and the general administration is a big part of it, but also we've talked about the need for communication and public outreach. And in Germany, the main language of that is German, which, and I think it's going to stay that way. And so th I think that that has two effects. It does leave some scientists out from engaging in those types of things, but also then leaves a lot of the responsibility to German scientists to do that public outreach. And so do you think there's any way that this can be overcome in the Max Planck Society? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, first of all, we are living in Germany. So it's totally natural that the public outreach, where the public mostly speaks German, should be one of the dominant languages that we should be communicating. Having said this, all of you know that the next generation of, of students, students, also in high schools, etc., Many of them are bilingual. So, so we need to actually just make sure that many of the things we do cater for both languages so that we can make also the, the minority, maybe right now, uh, understanding. At the same time, I think the international uh, you know, cohort of scientists that we have should also make an effort in, in learning the language. You don't have to be perfect uh, to be approachable. And, you know, I'm not perfect in German for sure, but every time I have spoken my broken German, I have always been taken with, with open arms and people are very forgiving to all the mistakes I do with my dare de das or anything else. So uh, I think, I think uh, rather than shying away, you know, your, your positive approach to public outreach uh, will be fantastic. Uh, And I have to say, this is actually a very important point. We need, as scientists, to be more engaging to the public. People don't sometimes understand why do you need to do basic research. It's much easier to see that, you know, taking a pill is directly helping you. Why do you need to understand something? And definitely, why do you need to work on a model organism that is so far away uh, from, from human beings? People don't understand the difficulties of, of doing research and, and advancing And it's our responsibility to go forward. And I know that it's hard. It's very, very difficult to explain to your grandparents what you do <laughs> uh, or your neighbor. And I think we have to just strive for making and continuously making that effort. 
there is again one no um, you know a magical way we can go forward we all have to individually make effort to go forward and only then we can make the society understand the importance of what we have and appreciate that investing in basic research is really important for the future of not only German science but also science worldwide. So um, something I find uh, personally interesting um, so you talk about uh, you're German do you can you talk about your science in German? Because I mean, in a couple of years in Germany, I can order a beer or, you know, at the supermarket, make a doctor's appointment. But I think that I would be, you know, pretty embarrassed trying to actually talk about my science in German. Tell me about it. No, <laughs> it is it's very daunting to explain this, uh, what I do in German. I have tried this to maybe relatives, but so far I have not been brave enough to do any kind of uh, really official scientific lecture in German yet. So I still have to work hard on that front. Yeah, I can relate to that. I mean, also it, it's hard because, you know, in your everyday life, the, the, the language that you speak is, is very different to what you'll have to do uh, if you do this in, uh, in German. And even German scientists have difficulties to explain this in German language if they are not used to to do this. So it's not just a problem of foreigners. I think it's it's um, it's a problem just generally. But I think we should all be making an effort, including myself, in helping improve our uh, German uh, because I think it's also a responsibility to go forward uh, and integrate uh, and take people along to say how great it is uh, to be a scientist. All right. Okay. So as a last question, uh, maybe could you tell us which was or maybe some advice uh, to uh, the younger researchers? Uh, what was the hardest part in your whole career and uh, how did you overcome it then? I think there were different parts that I would consider hard. I think the hardest part was really going from PhD to the postdoc because, uh, you know, starting doing research, there are so many things you don't know. You don't know how to approach questions, etc. But this was also the, the, the phase where I learned the most because how to be independent, how to formulate a hypothesis, what does it mean a failed experiment? What does this mean to go forward if the experiment worked? What will be the next set of uh, experiments that, that you will take if your hypothesis is going the right direction? Uh, I think was very important for me. But I think the phase, for me, this was also the time of realization, what were my strengths and what were my weaknesses? Uh, and, and I think that that's the reason why I say this was a very important step for me because I realized what I did really well and I wanted to do that further and where I was weak and I definitely didn't want to repeat this if I would continue in science. And one of the things I definitely changed was to be much more proactive and approaching and asking questions and not be shy if I didn't understand something. I was much more scared to go forward and ask that I didn't understand something or too intimidated uh, by my surroundings. And this was a learning curve that, uh, that, that I made. And I think that's why I think this was, again, you know, it was hard, but also the best time because it made me Uh, undergo that realization that helped me in the next steps. Uh, of course, my postdoc time is, is a different time again, because that's when you realize if you're not successful now, what is going to be the next step? You know, having a family and a research career at the same time is very hard as well, because you want to give justice to both parts of your life. And you feel guilty being in the lab and you feel guilty being at home because you suddenly have two families that need your attention. So, um, as I said, I think, you know, there are different stages, have different challenges, but I have to say I have a very supportive family and a very supportive lab. And because they both work together, we work all together to solve the problems. And I think that's the attitude I want to keep, to keep the positive spirits, because there will be many hurdles you will have to cross. I have still many hurdles to cross in front of me, but think positively and think, you know, how to go forward, even when there are days that where you're feeling low.
Okay, so basically that means just if there's some hardship, make sure that you're working together with your peers and so on to overcome it. And there will be a next step that you'll take eventually. Yeah. Don't feel lonely. I think there is always somebody you should be able mm -hmm. to go to. I think okay. that's very important that you have an infrastructure. If not, mm -hmm. you know, call me if you need my help. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, uh, we will definitely call you if we need your help. <laughs> Great. We've had a wonderful time talking to you today. and uh, Thank you. We really appreciate you spending the time with us. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we're looking forward to uh, a great first term, I would say, for you. Yeah, and thanks a lot for inviting me. You guys were fantastic. The questions were tough, and I hope I managed them. <laughs> but I really am looking forward to coming to the different institutes Mm -hmm. talking to the students and postdocs because I think uh, you are the future generation. We have to listen mm -hmm. to you if you want to go forward and progress the society forward. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thanks. It was Thanks great so having you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That was a wonderful discussion with Asifa, wasn't it? What do you guys think? Yeah, it was, it was really interesting. She felt very genuine in her opinions and desire to make life better for international researchers and students. Yeah, definitely. I mean, one point that I uh, uh, liked a lot was about the onboarding to make this a uh, bit of a smoother process, especially for internationals when they come here, have no idea what they have to do uh, with the official um, registration and so on. So making this uh, easier will definitely help also make their life uh, better, I think. Yeah, I imagine like coming from such an international background herself, like she's from a position where she really understands the importance of this. Yeah, I mean, having lived in like several countries, uh, she definitely has the experience uh, to know what people go through if they move to a different country where they might not even speak the language. What was really interesting was that she's really willing to uh, lend an arm and try to listen to what the other students have to say and like take suggestions because I think this is a very important uh, thing, right? As a new VP, I think it's very important that uh, you try to listen to what your, uh, what the masses have to say and where you can improve, right? Yeah. I mean, I think it was what an offspring first that uh, we actually had the person we were interviewing ask us questions. I mean, not necessarily, but yeah, it was one of those... Uh, rare moments where we had to give long form answers to uh, certain uh, targeted questions. Uh, because yes. I, I, of course, we do know that Max Planck Society have a lot of places to improve. And having a person who's willing to listen to the drawbacks that we have and try to implement these or take these into consideration is actually a really great step forward in the right direction. Anyway. It just, just allowing for people to uh, approach someone already being open is nice. It's very true, I completely agree with that sentiment. Anyway, with that I think we've come to the end of this uh, rather long discussion with uh, the new VP of the biomedical section of the Max Planck Society. And next week we'll have the interview with uh, Dr. Ulman Lindberger, who's the new VP of the, the Human Sciences section of the Max Planck Society. And that'll probably be the last episode of Offspring Magazine, the podcast for this year. Offspring Magazine, the podcast, is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD in the Science Communication Working Group known as the Offspring Magazine. The intro-outro music is composed by Fina Tamaku and the pre intro jingles composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you'd like to give us any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write to us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. This series is hosted by Fina Tamaku, Nicola Herman, Alison Lewis, Adrian Ahoya, and Sandra Fendel. With that, I bid you adieu and see you all next week. Until then, stay safe, stay healthy, and please make sure to follow all local governmental guidelines because safety is number one priority. Until then, ciao!